Hello and welcome to News Click on Monday, December 11, 2023. A five judge bench of the Supreme Court delivered its verdict on what we now know as the Article 370 cases related to Jammu and Kashmir. One of these petitions, filed by senior retired bureaucrats and military personnel, had argued that the sentiments of the people of Kashmir were disregarded by the central government when it, without consultation, read down Article 370 in August 2019. The court has today ruled that Article 370 was a temporary provision and Jammu and Kashmir held no to quote internal sovereignty after accession to India. It has also said that the concurrence of the state government was not required to apply the Indian constitution to the now erstwhile state in its entirety. It has also said elections must be held in Jammu and Kashmir and it has spoken about statehood. We go over to one of the petitions in this crucial matter, which will have ramifications, no doubt, on Indian politics, retired Air Vice Marshal Kapil Kak for his very first reactions. Thank you very much join, for joining us, uh, Mr. Kak. Let's, let's, begin, you know, let's begin with the basic question first. Now, given the record of the Supreme Court of not wanting to touch any legislative matter, any law the government passes, are you surprised by today's decision of the Supreme Court? You know, uh, I think it's not just me, but uh, I'd like to share with you and the viewers uh, that I have asked hundreds of people in the state of JNK over the last few months. And uh, there and my conviction has been absolutely doubtless that this is the kind of judgment we would get in essence. Uh, we can leave the commas and the full stops. And we were convinced that uh, up, uh, the abrogation would, would be upheld. There may be some, some kind of a relief in terms of statehood. And uh, as you rightly said, not touching any legislative business. And uh, as we will discuss in the interview, there are also some contradictions, and I don't want to comment upon the judgment of the Honorable Supreme Court, uh, the finest members of the judiciary at the apex level, uh, until I have seen the full judgment. We haven't, I, I haven't seen the full judgment, but I heard the deliberation, and that gives me an idea uh, to accept your very thoughtful and kind invitation to do a short interview. So no surprises there. Uh, very much on expected lines. Uh, the people, and I think one of the Supreme Court uh, judges, Honorable Sanjay Kaul, uh, talked about people being at the heart of the debate. Uh, I'm sorry, with all the respect to the Supreme Court uh, and the highest judiciary, utmost respect, that people are not under consideration here people of Jammu and Kashmir, for whom the Article 370 was meant. Uh, and repeatedly, uh, we hear only integration. We hear uh, certain points at which what happened and what didn't happen. And as I said, I, I can, uh, with, uh, with due respect to the uh, Supreme Court, Honorable Court, also point out some contradictions. Please go ahead. Before I move to any further questions that I might have, what are the contradictions that you seem to be referring to? You see, uh, the earlier Supreme Court judgments have said that the Article 370 has acquired a permanent character. Uh, this judgment is uh, unanimous on the point that Article 370 was temporary. Now, uh, and uh, that there was no internal sovereignty. Article 370 was a form of internal sovereignty. So sovereignty is never absolute. And I'm not a lawyer. And it's not rocket science to figure out uh, fine print of judgments and the points made therein. Uh, one palpable contradiction is that uh, the Supreme Court 
in utter disregard of Article 370 until its abrogation, Article 1, 2, and 3 of 370, enumerates very precisely, unambiguously, how it can be abrogated. And for that abrogation, constituent assemblies, concurrence, prior concurrence is required. Supreme Court has argued in their, in their judgment, I respect the judgment, that once the constituent assembly of JNK ceased to exist in 26th of January 1957, the president had all powers to do the abrogation of 370. That's point one. Point two is Supreme Court has itself declared ultra vires the employment of Article 367, which deals with interpreting constitutional articles, insertion of a clause there whereby uh, for the Constituent Assembly, read State Assembly. So the Parliament then becomes the repository of whatever State Assembly means. To me, and I'm not a lawyer, but as a humanist, as a security analyst, as somebody who's worked on the ground in JNK for two decades, 24 by 7, 24 by 7, I believe that the question of declaring 367 kind of ultra vires use of that, and then saying president has full powers under Article 3670. So this is a very, very, I mean, we need to keep in mind that this judgment is being read all over the world. It is not just in parts of India and certainly in the state of Jammu and Kashmir. So this is what I wanted to point out. Okay. Third is, I do not know, once again, with utmost respect to the Honorable Court, uh, what was the point of one of the members of the highest court in the country uh, talking about sentiment, talking about an epilogue in which he says this is a sentiment. We are dealing with a very, very critical issue of Article 370 of a very sensitive state, which has been under conflict for more than three decades. Where is the place for a sentiment expressed by a Supreme Court judge and then saying, but I leave it to the state of uh, the state to decide whether this sentiment should be brought in or not. To my mind, that sentiment and its expression is irrelevant. That is not the issue under discussion. But what do you make of the very noble sounding proposal that there be a truth and conciliation commission on the lines of South Africa? Do you think that is possible, no matter how good it may sound? It is, I, 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 as a principle, uh, okay. we accept, and that is what the Honorable Supreme Court judges also said, giving the example of South Africa. But South Africa, we need to understand that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was appointed after the issue had been resolved. Truth and Reconciliation Commission before the issue has been resolved, and therefore finding resolution through Truth and Conciliation is a horrible proposition to suggest. Because this will open up the wounds and you will never never come anywhere near uh, resolution of the issue. You mentioned the wounds. Now, you know, what does this decision mean to the Hindus and the Muslims of Jammu and Kashmir? Now, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, there is uh, uh, an element of uh, what I would say disjunction. Uh, why do I say this? As far as the Muslims of Jammu and Kashmir are concerned, I, I'm not, not just Jammu and Kashmir, I would also like to point out Ladakh, particularly this district of Kargil. Uh, as far as the Hindus in the valley are concerned, and roughly about 15,000 in number, wholeheartedly supportive of the idea of continuance of Article 370. As far as the Hindus or Kashmiri Pandits, as we are called, incidentally, I am a Kashmiri Pandit too, who live in Jammu. They have gone along with the abrogation from 5th and 6th of August 2019 and celebrated it. 
But sadly, the people within whom they live, that is the Dogras of Jammu, they have expressed reservations about the way this article abrogation has panned out. Because demography, if anything, has demography, if anything, has affected Jammu region. It's culturally, geographically very close to northern Punjab. So by removing certain impediments to that uh, demographic change or economic uh, breakthrough in regional terms, they have been the sufferers. It doesn't happen to Kashmir Valley. So uh, that is as far as the Hindu and Muslims are. Muslims are the valley, frankly. I've been, I have talked to hundreds of people over the last week or so, completely and totally indifferent to this judgment because they knew what the judgment would be like. Each one of them was convinced it will be a judgment which will uphold Article 370 abrogation. And as to statehood and uh, elections, they are again disinterested in the sense that the sufferance is total because they have gone through denial of rights. I mean, we again come back to the point about the people being at the heart, which uh, uh, Justice S.K. Call mentioned in his ep epilogue. But if you're talking about people being at the heart of the issue of 370 in the state of Jammu and Kashmir, particularly in the Valley of Kashmir, then I'm afraid neither the Honorable Supreme Court nor the government of India have addressed this. It is not a development issue. Yes, maybe economic development is taking place. Maybe tourists are visiting utmost sense of normalcy, traffic jams. But there is a bigger jam inside the hearts and minds of the people. And that goes back to not just 5th and 6th August 2019, but even before that, whether it is denial of rights, it is uh, criminalization of your profession of journalism, complete clampdown on, on whatever the journalists write, and uh, hauling them in cyber police stations and elsewhere to see that whatever they post uh, is is cleared by by the government that's not that's not democracy is journalism uh, people not being allowed to express their views not being allowed to meet now this is part of what they see as oppression well it could be termed from the point of view of the center that this is a process of integration. It demands hard, muscular policies being adopted to ensure that this integration takes place. But may I submit once again, Pragya, for your consideration, integration is a mutual process between the state and the Indian Union. It has to be under mutually acceptable accommodative principles which are negotiated through a dialogue, through talks, that's not happening. There's no dialogue one has seen in decades. I think the last kind of an informal dialogue between the center and, and uh, the political leadership uh, was sometimes in 2006 or 2007, when Manmohan Singh's government had actually started the process of talking to the political leadership of the state, including separatist leadership. Right. And we had come to, as you know, more than anyone else, through what is called the four-point formula or the peace process, come to a situation that you don't only resolve the issue of Jammu and Kashmir through non-territorial means and no exchange of territories, but people-to-people -people contact uh, across the line of control, movement of uh, relatives to each other's uh, countries because there are relatives on both sides of the line of control and the border and uh, various other issues of common interest like climate change, like water resources, forestry resources. Uh, all that was part of that hasn't happened. Uh, we haven't moved forward and it's now nearly 16 years since we had a last dialogue. So how do we, therefore, if people are at the heart of an issue, how can we move forward through constitutional fiats, which are, which are inherently unilateral and without the consultation? I mean, I'm saying this uh, 
uh, with a very clear conscience that we needed to, uh, this is something perhaps the Supreme Court uh, it was very much aware of. Of course, they have not uh, deemed it appropriate to include this aspect for in their judgment. That right. when this was, when the uh, when uh, constitutional order two seven two and two seven three and the reorganization of JNK state when they were announced on the floor of parliament, before that announcement, five thousand five hundred political workers, including pro India mainstream leaders, were imprisoned. They were under house arrest, and clampdowns were put in jail. So I think the judgment has to be linked with those processes as well. You know, one of the things mm -hmm. the Supreme Court has half uh, hinted at is the security concerns. And you just mentioned that the Muslims in the valley are silent. Mm -hmm. To what extent is that silence because of the exhaustion with militancy, with the ebb and flow of, of you know, violence um, of various kinds in the state? And, and will that Will that mean that there is a sort of consensus on then on that you know ye to hona hi tha is one way of looking at it, but is there a hope, a sliver of hope that maybe this will improve thing, what the court has called full integration and the complete application of the Constitution of India? Uh, I'm sorry, the Supreme Court's hope that you talked about uh, is confronting with the utmost sense of hopelessness in the valley. Now, if you're talking about hope in the rest of India, including the Indian Union and the central government, one thing. But when you talk about the hopelessness of Kashmir, it's not going to, this will in no way help integration. If anything, this will worsen the inside mind and heart of the people of the valley. Why do I say this? Because they're deeply alienated, they're angry, but they are not coming out earlier as they did with stones and with protests. And But uh, it is a, uh, as a student of history, I know that when you keep a issue suppressed and when you don't allow people their democratic aspirations, after all, why aren't any elections held for the last six years? No, not six years, nine years. That's the last true. election was in 2014. The last time when people had their elected representatives was in 2018. That's also a full term of an assembly. Why hasn't that happened? And the holding of elections, to my mind, is once again a kind of a, a fixed match because the government says that uh, it is up to the election commission. You go to the chief election commissioner. He says that, well, we have to consult the government. And even the Supreme Court in its wisdom has decided the elections were will be done before the 30th September 2024. I have not read the judgment. I do not know what's the reason for fixing 30th September and not 30th April. You as a journalist can provide the answer. Well, I was I was going to ask you, will will Ladakh actually now remain a union territory? Does Ladakh lose the chance of full statehood completely? Is that hope extinguished there? No, uh, on that, uh, they have, uh, the Honorable Supreme Court have uh, not adjudicated on uh, the lowering of state of Jammu and Kashmir status to that of a union territory. That is a bit of a surprise. Why haven't they adju adjudicated there? Because as far as I know, and I'm not a lawyer, Article 3 doesn't allow you to downgrade a state to a union territory. It allows you to take out some parts of a state to form a union territory, which is what has been done in, in, in the case of Ladakh. But Article 3 also says there have been consultations with the, this, that particular state. Of course, you can argue with the lawyer that uh, as a lawyer, that since the state is not, uh, assembly doesn't exist, who do we consult? Therefore, we consult the parliament, which is doing it on behalf of uh, uh, the state assembly. And uh, then the government of Jammu and Kashmir it doesn't exist. So therefore, we consult the governor, who's a central appointee. So you see the 
these are the huge contradiction that i was talking about mutual contradiction which uh, which which uh, which will pain and cause a great deal of grief uh, to the people of the valley as far as ladakh is concerned you are already aware ladakh is up in arms people of kargil have recently met the home minister seeking redressal by way of some kind of return to the old time uh, before 5th and 6th august that's right these issues i don't want to go into detail likewise the buddhist majority leh region is also feeling suffocated because of lack of democracy because there is a bureaucrat who are uh, running the show in ladakh earlier they at least had a jnk assembly where their representatives were elected and they put forward their issues in that assembly now there is no forum for them to accept their uh, any of their grievances other than the bureaucracy which is once again appointed by the central government you seem to be saying that the wishes of the people of jammu and kashmir including ladakh appear to be completely sidelined and do you also feel along with that that the politics of the rest of india especially in the north vis-a-vis -vis kashmir has taken precedence somewhere or the other and that continues no, I, I i think it would not be fair because I, I, as i said uh, i do not want to comment on what drives the hearts and minds of honorable supreme court judges who pronounce uh, this verdict uh, what are the political factors in their minds is beyond my remit and i wouldn't like to comment i have the utmost respect for the supreme court Uh, which is the apex judiciary in india uh, so I, i would not comment on the politics of the north having an effect but i can only comment on what they have what have they have read out and that i heard every word and that doesn't explain as to how 30th september as the last date for the elections uh, is valid <laughs> because uh, i know what the kashmiris will say to that and i can say i can share that with you what the 30th say? september is because then the elections to the central uh, to the national level would have been completed by may june and then you can hold elections in kashmir but if you hold elections in kashmir today the ruling dispensation will be wiped out through a democratic process that is the assessment of the people in kashmir so they don't want it so the supreme court in that sense as the kashmiri said not that i say what my friends tell me from the valley that this could be the reason why it has been kept 30th september one more point very very important i'd like to conclude this because i have some people waiting in the line for an interview uh, that elections should be done by 30th september fine statehood as soon as possible the supreme okay. court is reiterating exactly what amit shah said on the floor of the parliament as soon as normalcy returns kashmir hasn't seen normalcy for 30 years or to quote the home minister and and the central dispensation they said everything is normal in kashmir if it is normal then why don't you have elections in two months so everything is not normal so what is said is not the fact on the ground and what is fact on the ground is not said by the ruling dispensation to conclude uh, sir last thing what are your feelings are you extremely disappointed do you feel perhaps a tinge angry or is there some hope of something changing you know i have uh, you, you may not be aware since you asked a personal question let me share my personal view in the issue i ha i have been in the flying branch of the indian air force i wore an air force uniform took part in two india pakistan wars i do have an idea of issues of politics and security sometimes if you do or overdo security then you tend to create a politics which creates insecurity so one has to be very very cautious in managing the circularity of politics and security uh, the honorable supreme court 
you would have observed has also talked about integration integration repeatedly this expression was put and even the abrogation was described as the final final step in the integration but integration from whose perspective maybe the, the as article 370 itself says otherwise it wouldn't have existed because that sort of established a bridge between the Jammu and Kashmir sovereign the, when it was incorporated after Maharaja acceded to uh, another sovereign country. Maharaja was a sovereign king of an independent state on 26th of October 1947 when he, uh, when he signed the instrument of accession. So was, so was India, sovereign India, post-independence. Now, between two sovereigns then, the question arises, how much do you respect the wishes of the people? I have to say without hesitation that Maharaja of Kashmir went by the constitution of 1939. Article 35A was nothing but his constitutional order of 1927 and then 1928 or 29, by which he gave the residents of his state, citizens of his state, certain special privileges in terms of land, in terms of job, in terms of identity. What was subsequently formulated as Article 370, because he, the Maharaja had powers over every issue other than defense, foreign relations, and communication. Right. So, so when you say, you know, the people and how they view this situation, uh, I, I seem to think uh, that firstly, I expected it. Secondly, I'm also a petitioner, as you know. I have been one of the 23 petitioners. And why would a former armed forces officer uh, who is a resident of the state feel strongly enough to petition the highest court in India that what the central government has done is wrong? So that way I'm disappointed as a 90% of the Kashmiris in the valley, and also very significant percentage of people in the Jammu region, and also uh, people of Ladakh. So there's it's a it's a disappointment in that regional demographic geography. Right, sir. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, we hope to have another conversation a few days down the line when you've seen the judgment and when the picture gets a little more clear. Thank you. Thank you.